the Charles Phillips Taft Research Center uh, for sponsoring this talk and thank the Department of History uh, also for co-sponsoring the talk and especially uh, Dr. Frierson for helping arrange the talk um, and, and, and lead me through the paperwork. Um, just for the late, I'll, I'll cut short introductions, but I do want to say it's my privilege to welcome uh, Dr. Gordon and uh, yeah, please take it away. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, I'll uh, second the thanks to everyone at Charles Phelps Research Center and the History Department here and to Rob. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I'll just uh, jump in. My talk has to do with a book project that I'm working on now. Um, I'm going to give you sort of the, the skeleton of the book, really. Uh, it's a three-part talk. Uh, and I'm looking at two groups of slaves of the 9th century Abbasid Empire. So the Arab Islamic Empire, uh, and I'm going to do something I think that other historians uh, don't do and would, might disagree with, which is to join these two groups of slaves to the much larger community of, of slaves and the much larger slave market of the 9th century Abbasid Empire. So, so that's by way of introduction. Um, I think that while we're running late, I'll try to jump over one or two things. Um, but. It should run to about 35 minutes, and then I'm, I guess we'll have a Q&A and if you have any uh, follow-up. Um, so, a distinct feature of elite 9th century Abbasid society is the admission into its ranks of individuals of slave descent. The discussion that follows considers the manner in which the members of two groups of slave origin assume positions of influence and responsibility, that is, authority as uh, brokers of politics, society, and culture. The setting is the Arab Islamic Empire of the late 9th century, and specifically the social fabric of two cities, Baghdad and Samarra, the administrative centers of the early Caliphate, early Abbasid Caliphate. Modern scholarship seldom treats the two slave groups in conjunction with one another. In a variety of respects, the two histories are in fact distinct, as will become clear. But an underlying argument here is that the two histories share significant features. There are two features that I'll focus on, a, a pattern of upward social mobility and the establishment of significant households. The one group consisted of elite female entertainers, most of whom were singers and musicians. The nature of their public activity, alongside an impressive network of personal contacts and professional contacts, permit reference to them as courtesans. The members of the second group were military men, high-ranking officers of the predominantly Turkish and inner Asian regiments of the Abbasid military, singers and commanders. The distinction on grounds of gender and their access to decision-making circles should be obvious. A key distinction, of course, lies in the nature of the labor that each set of individuals provided to imperial state and society alike. To return to the underlying point, despite these divergences of standing and career, there is good reason to take stock of uh, singers and commanders together. The attempt here, in other words, is to carry out a particular kind of collective history. The approach means less attention is paid to individual stories, the biographies. And second, the distinctions just alluded to are treated, in fact, as secondary. Joining the two histories is the common experience of slavery. Research on slavery as a feature of Abbasid urban society has moved slowly relative to the measured but productive work on the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the early modern periods. The principal evidence that I've used is provided by predominantly Arabic sources, uh, chronicles, biographical dictionaries, works of travel, geography, political advice, uh, the law, of course, very important uh, source, and collections of poetry and belletka, among others. An emerging corpus of published papyri collections, so these are specific documents, promise to advance our awareness of Abbasid uh, slavery as well. The evidence seems clear that both groups of individuals joined urban Near Eastern society as slaves, such was their initial civil or legal standing. Did they remain slaves? For what duration? And to what extent did they retain that initial standing? Given the interest of this paper and the dynamics of social mobility, the question needs to be asked. But to underscore the point that we are not always well served by our sources, the Arabic Islamic sources, there is little to evidence on hand to answer the question in full. There is, for example, little on hand regarding formal manumission, particularly of the Turkish soldiers. The topic of this paper concerns access to elite standing. It has to do with movement across socio-cultural, legal, and even political boundaries. And as I will suggest later, with the creation of elite households. 
on the part of members of two groupings of slaves or former slaves. A first task then is to locate both sets of individuals at the point of their acquisition and entry into Near Eastern society. Or if we think in terms of a narrative, it, this is the first phase, that this is where the story begins. In the one case, that of the singers, it is a matter of meeting demand for young women, suitably trained and physically attractive, this on the part of upper class or upper crust Near Eastern urban society. The evidence suggests a process whereby promising candidates were culled from a larger populace of young slave women and groomed as entertainers and social companions. It refers to their training in singing, poetry, the playing of such instruments as the oud, uh, we know it as the lute, uh, other stringed instruments and various forms of percussion, the language arts in general, including at least familiarity with the Quran and Hadith, and sundry other skills. The consumption of these young, well-trained women appears to have its origin as well as, uh, as a social and cultural practice in pre-Islamic Arab society. Uh, and I think it's also true that uh, it reflects Byzantine and Sassanid practice and then practice across ancient Eurasia more broadly. In the ninth century, the height of the Abbasid reign, the practice was driven by the imperial court itself. Innumerable anecdotes, notably those collected in al Fahani's 10th century Kitab al-Aghani, the Book of Psalms, uh, a large work of, of uh, biographies of singers and poets and others. Uh, these, these anecdotes have one Abbasid ruler after another and the members of their inner circles in close association with and in possession of large numbers of women singers. The example of the imperial court was then duplicated across elite palaces and fine homes. The imperial court, in this sense, modeled one highly visible complex of cultural practice. To meet the demand, slave merchants exploited markets, the slave trade, and population slave raids in nearly every region bordering the empire. A widely cited text, the 11th century treatise of Ibn Butlan, a Baghdadi scholar of Nestorian Christian background and physician by trade, is essentially a short handbook on the purchase and physical examination of slaves. At least it lists the ethnicities and regions from which female slaves could be or were acquired, with comments on the qualities of each category of women, principally sexual and physical. The range of geographical references is striking. I might add regarding Ibn Butland that his comments, uh, particularly those on African women, strike the modern reader as barely short of ethnic typecasting, what we would consider slurs, but by the same token, of course, stand as evidence of the stigma that attached to slavery in this period or to be more precise, as evidence of a cluster of attitudes related closely to slavery. Uh, but there is also evidence for an internal slave market in Abbasid Iraq. The Aghani, again, uh, this book of songs, an invaluable source on the lives and careers of the elite singers, describes in effect a steady traffic in the daughters of uh, slave women. A feature of these texts is a series of passages, some of them quite detailed, in which the slave singers protest their treatment nagging questions surround the origin and intent of these passages, and it would be naive to not grapple with the historiographical elements at work, the rhetorical elements at work in these texts. The point here is only that the passages in question speak directly to the girls' treatment, that is, the sale of the young women to slave merchants, and thus their rude entry into the slave market, their subsequent handling. In each case, the complaint on the part of the singer turns on, if, on in effect, a legal point that because they were the offspring of free males, each father, usually the head of a household, had produced the child with a slave woman in his possession, they were by law to have free standing. So if the father is free and claims paternity, uh, the children are free. Islamic law also stipulates that the mothers of these girls, they assume a status known as um walad, uh, took out particular protections. All of this is stipulated by Islamic law, and there does not appear to be disagreement on this score between the different schools, uh, madahib, of Islamic law. But to return to the original point, these and other forms of evidence indicate that the traffic in young female slaves drew on two broad sources. A trans-regional market in young female slaves, and an equally busy market contained within the boundaries of the Abbasid realm. 